Hello. Uh, welcome uh, to this month's DC Federalist Society chapter virtual lunch. Uh, my name is Reg Brown, uh, and I am uh, pleased to serve uh, as the president of our chapter. Uh, I trust that you've all ordered Chinese takeout and are settled in for a great presentation and discussion consistent with the finest traditions of our organization. I am awaiting my order of Kung Pao chicken and Sichuan beans, which should be arriving by drone delivery uh, any uh, minute. Um, I've received a last minute note uh, from Jeffrey Tubin, uh, who says that he's otherwise occupied and will not be able to join us uh, today, uh, which is too bad. Um, we're pleased to be joined uh, today by the distinguished lawyer, historian, and author, Michael Barone, who literally wrote the book on American elections and political activity. That book is called The Almanac of American Politics and has been published consistently uh, every other year from 1972 uh, through 2020. The Almanac is chock full of amazing data and is now nearly 2,000 pages in length. In connection with his work on the Almanac, I'm told that Mr. Barone has traveled to all 50 states and all 435 congressional districts. I'd like to know whether he's also made it to Guam uh, and Puerto Rico uh, as well, or if they're on his list. Mr. Barone is a graduate of Harvard University and the Yale Law School, where he was editor of the Yale Law Review uh, and following law school clerk for Judge uh, Wade McCree on the Sixth Circuit. Uh, Mr. Barone has received the Bradley Prize from the Lynn and Harry Bradley Foundation and is also a recipient of the Barbara Olson Award and the Kerry McWilliams Award from the American Political Science Association. Those of you who are members of our beloved society know that we do not take positions as an organization on political issues, but this being DC, the set of issues around elections are of great interest for a whole host of reasons. There are fascinating constitutional and statutory issues tied to campaigns, campaign finance, election results, and the mechanics of the Electoral College, for instance. Likewise, the results of this year's election may have extraordinary implications for the courts, including possibly the size and membership of the Supreme Court in the years to come. I'm sure that all of these issues will come up today, and whether you are a conservative, a libertarian, a progressive, or something in between, I know that you will find our guests insightful uh, and informative. The format uh, that we're going to follow today uh, will start with a presentation from Mr. Barone, uh, after which uh, you are welcome uh, to uh, put questions into the chat function, and I will try to faithfully uh, recount those uh, questions uh, to Mr. Barone. So with that, uh, we're all excited to hear from our guests, and I'll turn it over to you, Michael. Well, thank you very much, Reg. It's very nice to be with you, uh, giving my quadrennial pre-election pre talk to the Federalist Society. Uh, as you note, um, among my credentials in life, I am a graduate of the Yale Law School. I like to say that's the next best thing to know law school at all. Uh, and uh, and I, have a, I can claim to have a professional career in, uh, in the law. I was a law clerk uh, for two years to Judge Wade H. McCree Jr. of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And uh, at a time when the Sixth Circuit was a very collegial court. Uh, I, uh, I also engaged to some extent in the private practice of law and to the extent of four billable hours for which I was paid for two. So consequently, uh, I, I moved on to other things. I like to say that I've moved uh, in my professional life from uh, one career to another, each success of one which tends to pay less and to have a lower degree of integrity and intellectual honesty than the one before. So I started off in the law at a very high level, obviously, by those criteria. 
Then I took a small step down to political consulting. Uh, and then rather a steeper plunge into journalism. Uh, and the only thing now left for me is academia. Um, I'm not present and recipient of any offers uh, to uh, at any colleges or universities at all. Uh, as I recall, when I spoke to this group uh, back in 2008, uh, I began by saying, you can't win them all. Uh, I don't think I began this way uh, four years ago in 2016, um, but I do begin today by acknowledging that the president who has probably appointed more federal society members to like federal judgeships uh, than any other president in history is trailing uh, the noted legal scholar who was for 16 years chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, Joe Biden, by a 7.9% margin in the real clear politics average of recent polls. That's down from 10% 10 days ago, uh, but it's still well behind. Uh, and if we were interpreting these poll numbers um, in any, if, if, as if, the, if without the knowledge of the 2016 election um, before us, I think that we might very well just say, well, this election is over with 11 days to go. Um, Joe Biden has a lead popular vote over um, outside the margin of error uh, and so forth. It is larger than the uh, last poll that uh, the in 1948, which showed Thomas Dewey 5.0% of Harry Truman in the last Gallup poll conducted in 1948. That was a poll uh, that was conducted between nine and 19 days before election day. They figured it was all over and there was no reason to go out and do what you had to do then in polling, which was conduct door-to-door -door interviews and then send the interview responses back to, um, to the head office by post office, at which point they would be hand tallied by clerks who would you know, put four, line, four vertical lines and one horizontal line to tally each five votes. It was a time consuming thing and they didn't have figure they had enough time to do it. And of course that resulted in one of the biggest uh, upsets uh, in the history of polling, which now goes back to 1935, 85 years ago. Uh, but I see two reasons for caution about overconfident uh, extrapolations from those poll results to, the, uh, to who is gonna be elected president. Uh, in the result when people will be voting on election day, November 3rd, or when the election is decided when the votes are counted at some subsequent date. Um, one, reason, one reason for caution is, is the 2016 result. Um, you, you go back uh, then and you see that Donald Trump won that election despite Hillary Clinton's consistent poll leanings. Um, we, those of us who watch this on television can remember seeing uh, all those uh, faces of people preparing to celebrate Hillary Clinton's victory at the Javits Center on the west side of Manhattan with its glass ceiling. Uh, they weren't going to go break the glass ceiling literally, but the idea was her victory would be a metaphorical uh, breaking of the glass ceiling. They were pretty confident it was going to happen. And sometime between 9 and 10 Eastern time, uh, the mood changed and became very much darker. And I think even those of us who were not in favor of Hillary Clinton's candidacy, but who have been spent um, some significant number of election nights feeling very unhappy about uh, some of the results, um, had to sympathize with the people at the Javits Center that they had uh, a very uh, a, an unhappy surprise from their point of view. Uh, and um, this was um, something that wasn't anticipated. And so consequently, I think that, uh, that you know, the, the Hillary Clinton's lead um, over uh, Donald Trump in the 2016 polls was slightly less in the national polls than what we've got for Joe Biden now, um, but it was still uh, looked to be a significant lead. Uh, and in fact, she did win the popular vote which leads me to the second reason for caution. Uh, and that's uh, summed up in the word California. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is put things in historical perspective. 
um, and from the 1820s, when, when, as you may recall, John Marshall was the Chief Justice. Uh, John Marshall was appointed, by the way, by President John Adams about 10 days before his term in office was ending after he was defeated by Thomas Jefferson and confirmed by a Senate which was going out of office at that same March 4th date when the Federalists would no longer have a majority in the Senate. Uh, and he lasted for 34 years in the Supreme Court and nobody uh, seems to have made the argument, at least successfully, that he was an illegitimate Chief Justice. Certainly, he was a consequential one. But from the 1820s uh, until uh, the early years of this century, uh, the nation's largest state, and that was New York from the 1820s until 1963, California since 1963, the nation's largest state voted pretty much close to the national average within 5% of the national average in every election. New York was not an overwhelmingly Democratic or an overwhelmingly Republican state during the 140 years when it was the largest state. California was very close to the national average for a long time. That's no longer true. California is now an outlier, the number two Democratic state in 2016 voting just about 14 points more Democratic than the national average, exceeded in Democratic percentage only by Hawaii, uh, the home of the le legal scholar, Senator Maisie Hirono. Um, and California uh, is responsible for all of uh, Hillary Clinton's popular vote plurality and more. Uh, if you take California out of the popular vote uh, percentage, you see that Donald Trump is ahead in the popular vote by a 48 to 46 margin, reversing Hillary Clinton's margin that happens if you include California. Um, and so California weights any poll that you see, basically, there's national poll. There are about six points for the Democratic nominee from California. There's only about two or three points for Donald Trump or the Republican nominee from California and the results that are going to make a difference beyond California's 55 electoral votes are those coming from uh, other states. So I like to take a look at this point at the poll numbers in the six top target states uh, in this election. Um, and they were all for Donald Trump four years ago, many of them contrary to expectations. Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, um, currently, uh, Joe Biden leads um, those, the collective results from their, those six states by about the 4% as Hillary Clinton did 11 days out in the 2016 election. Um, his lead is three points or less than Florida, North Carolina, and Arizona. Those are clearly in the, in the margin of error and cannot be considered, in my judgment, safe uh, for either Biden, the candidate who's leading in those polls, or for Trump. Uh, five points in Pennsylvania <coughs> and Wisconsin, eight points in my home state of Michigan. You can cherry pick and find some polls in each of those states that are better for Donald Trump. You can find some polls that are better for Joe Biden. But in terms of getting an approximate idea of where the race stands, I think it's better to take an aggregate form to get the average of the polls as you can get real clear politics in Nate Silver's 538.com thing. Um, and so what I would say for that result is that despite the national polls showing about an eight point lead for, uh, for, for Joe Biden, uh, Donald Trump is within range, but in order to win, he's got to do something that looks like uh, drawing to an inside straight in poker. Um, the good news for Donald Trump is that that's possible. That sort of thing happened four years ago. Uh, the bad news for him is, of course, that the odds are against it. Um, and the, um, uh, so consequently, uh, that's the, those odds are against it. The, um, the, the uh, so basically, uh, polls in, in also polls don't always uh, aren't always tilted towards the same party in election after election. Um, 
2016 national poll showed Hillary Clinton leading the popular vote by three points. She led it by two points. It's very close given the limitations of polls. Um, the polls in some of these states like Wisconsin and Michigan were either few and far between or were far off the final result indicating either a late move, an unusual turnout, or the fact that the polls just didn't hit target uh, and were wrong. Um, but, you know, the polls, so the polls tilted uh, towards the Democrats in 2016. You go back four years, 2012, they tilted towards the Republicans. Um, pollsters try to learn from their errors, and sometimes they comp try to compensate for them. Sometimes they overcompensate, go too far in the other direction. Uh, in 2016, many pollsters undersampled white non-college voters. They, they non-college graduates, they didn't look at them as a separate category or one that they ought to weight their responses uh, for, um, because in the past, um, white non-college voters basically overall tended to vote like white college graduates overall. There weren't much differences. Um, but basically, um, going back a few cycles, you can see this movement started, but it became a kind of crescendo in 2016. Non-college whites famous, so have been trending Republican, especially in 2016. White college graduates have been trending Democratic. We saw that in 2016 and more in 2018 in the off-year elections. Um, this time, many pollsters have taken care to try and adjust their sample or to weight their responses uh, in order to reflect the percentage that white non-college voters have in the electorate as a whole. A percentage that, by the way, has been larger than what is recorded in exit polls that the uh, consortium hired by the television networks and other news organizations uh, has indicated. Um, other pollsters are not adjusting uh, for co white college status and are at risk, I, in my judgment, of missing changes here. So basically, uh, non-college white votes were for Trump. He did much better with that group than basically um, any Republican has done uh, before going back at least to Ronald Reagan in 1984. In some cases, he's done better, like Western Pennsylvania. He ran ahead of Ronald Reagan uh, among that group. And so he won 100 electoral votes that Mitt Romney had lost in 2012 in Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, and that one vote in the second congressional district of Maine. Uh, he came within one, two, or three points in three states with 20 more electoral votes, New Hampshire, Minnesota, and Nevada. Um, and uh, that uh, the question now is overall national polls are showing him doing worse among white college, white non-college voters, including but maybe particularly among women. Uh, there's some danger when you look at overall polls and try and slice up the electorate that the sample size is so small that the error margin is so large that you can't really make assumptions about it. Um, even as he's running slightly better, it seems, than four years before among Black American voters, among uh, voters classified as Hispanic, um, despite the charges that are uh, constantly made, usually without uh, any supporting evidence that uh, Trump is a racist, he seems to be doing somewhat better with those voters. Uh, the key state, in my view, in many ways, is Pennsylvania. Uh, and it's interesting that um, for those of you who watched the debate last night, um, President Trump seemed to be uh, very careful about uh, informing uh, voters after Vice President Biden uh, indicated that he wanted to phase out frac uh, you know, fracking and uh, fossil fuels and so forth. Uh, he said, pay attention, Pennsylvania. Um, he was aiming at those electoral votes. Um, that's it. So basically, my overall assumption is uh, there's still a chance for Donald Trump. We've had some 45 million votes have already been cast by people voting early. Um, the voting by people voting by mail is heavily tilted towards Democratic voters because as we've seen in response to the coronavirus, Democratic voters and Democratic politicians have been more risk averse and more um, unwilling to 
participate in crowd events. You've been the teachers unions insisting that schools not be reopened despite the overwhelming evidence that there's no significant danger uh, of, of um, deadly disease for either students or teachers. Um, and so you see a lot of Democratic voters have wanted to vote by mail this year. That's going to be something of a problem in counting the votes in some of these states, which are not used to having a large number of votes uh, delivered by mail. And I believe it's the case in Pennsylvania and Michigan, for example, that election group people are, uh, clerks are not allowed to count those votes until election day. Some other states, they're able to count them early. Um, we've had some decisions in which the Supreme Court has actually taken a part in some cases um, where uh, typically it's Democrats who want to extend the time during which uh, um, votes can be submitted or ballots. Republicans have tended to say, no, we've got to enforce the rules that are in force there. In most of those cases, uh, the Democrats have not prevailed, although in Pennsylvania, uh, with the decision of their Supreme Court and an evenly divided U.S. Supreme Court, they have. Um, I think, let me address uh, one other set of elections that I think is particularly important to Federalist Society members or to many of you. And that is the Senate races. Um, it's a subject of more than minimal interest. Um, you know, because we currently have a 5347 Republican Senate race, uh, Senate, which seems uh, clearly will confirm its third successive Supreme Court justice in the <laughs> last four years uh, in Amy Conner, Coney Barrett on Monday. Um, we have the Republicans seem sure to pick up one seat by beating the uh, Democrat Doug Jones in Alabama heavily Democrat, Republican state where he was able to win against a really wacko candidate. Um, and uh, the in Michigan, uh, candidate John James, the Republican nominee, is not far behind uh, Gary Peters, who for some period of time has been the U.S. Senator with the lowest substantive I, name ID uh, in his home state. Um, but Repu Republicans are in danger of losing many other seats. Uh, Cory Gardner and Martha McSally seem to be far behind in uh, Colorado and Arizona. Other Republican incumbents trailing within the margin of error include Joni Ernst in Iowa, Tom Tillis, North Carolina, Susan Collins in Maine. Republicans have narrow, uh, scarily narrow leads and seats in South Carolina, Georgia, Kansas, and Montana, all states that Donald Trump carried four years before, and at least three of which he's expected to carry easily, Georgia being the exception this time. <coughs> I think there's a possible upset. If I had to identify an upset at this point, I might pick John James in Michigan, or maybe Jason Lewis, the Republican challenger to Senator Tina Smith in Minnesota. There was a recent, one recent poll showed that a close race. We're waiting to see if it's uh, gonna, if there are gonna be others. Uh, in the House, it seems pretty clear that Nancy Pelosi's Democrats will retain and marginally increase their majority, which is currently at 232-203. Um, that means retaining most of their 2018 gains, which mostly have been in high education districts. I'm gonna start calling them high credential voters, uh, the kind of places where most Federalist Society members are tend to live, I suspect. Um, I always say, if you want to see areas that have turned against Donald Trump, uh, go get a directory of uh, Harvard Law School alumni to take one of a number of examples of for Yale Law School alumni, Columbia, Chicago, whatever school uh, you want, highly selective law school. The places where those people tend to live are the places that have been historically, in many cases, Republican, uh, with high income voters tilting uh, now towards the Democrats, so repelled by the persona, perhaps by the policies of Donald Trump. Um, he seems to have been a too heavy load of, for any of them to carry. And uh, this is part of a trend which Trump did not begin, but which has been emphasized under Trump, of the Republicans becoming a more downscale party, uh, and at the same time, one with more racial diversity, 
as Trump seems to be attracting somewhat more uh, black and Hispanic voters, uh, but has been losing uh, white uh, college graduates. Uh, let me conclude with a note on redistricting, which is something I've been following for a period of time. As Reg indicated, I've been um, writing, uh, I started the Almanac of American Politics. I'm a founding and longtime co-author uh, since the first edition appeared some 49 years ago. Um, and I've been, as a consequence of that, I have been following congressional redistricting because the book covers each state and each of the 435 congressional districts, all of which I've been in. I followed the redistricting cycles going up before and including the Supreme Court's equal population decisions in 1963 and 64, uh, and in the cycles uh, follow, in the multiple cycles following. And over the past several years, we've been hearing much talk today among people that consider themselves to be kind of good government advocates about how computers have enabled partisan redistricting to totally control the majorities that led Congress, and led House of Representatives and led state legislatures how this is a great threat to democracy, how it's undermining the ability of people to be represented, how uh, the redistrictors can carry all before them. It's interesting to me, however, that in the cycles following the 1960, 1970, and 1980 censuses, which were cycles in which the um, Democrats tended to have the advantage in redistricting, Democrats then controlled most of the state legislatures. They had good electoral cycles going in, in 1970 and 80, which continued their controls. I can remember staying up late at night with the, the Congressman Phil Burton of San Francisco. Um, many of you may not remember, but uh, Phil used to drink, uh, he'd, his drink of choice was vodka without ice in tumblers, and he'd go in for multiple of this, getting more lucid about the redistricting situation, not only in California, where he had a splendid uh, district gerrymander in the 70s and 80s, but all over the country. Um, and I don't remember all these great and good reformers uh, being very upset about redistricting when the dem when the uh, when it was the uh, uh, Democrats who were controlling redistricting and which were using it in many parts to maintain their longstanding congressional majority in the House of Representatives um, that started to change a little bit in the 1990 census cycle when redistricting politically redistricting was a kind of a wash between the two political parties. And when the Republicans in 1994, for the first time in 40 years, won a majority in the House of Representatives, and that's, you know, the Democrats had a 40 period of control. Uh, the only, the long, second longest period of control in the history of the Congress is only 16 years. 40 years was a real long time. Uh, the lamentations about the evils of redistricting have been crescendoed in the cycles following the 2000 and 2010 cycles. And I think not coincidentally, that's because redistricting tended to favor the Republicans at that point. They had majorities uh, in many legislatures, which they had never had before. They had, uh, they were, part of that was being able to win in more downscale districts uh, uh, as well as upscale districts. They tended and to draw plans that were favorable to them. Um, but I have thought as a aficionado of redistricting, and I've even done a little redistrict, partisan redistricting myself. And as a, when I was co-authoring this Almanac book, of course, every 10 years or so, I would look and try and see what the party in control of redistricting uh, was going to do to maximize their effects. So I've gone through the brain functions of uh, imagining myself to be a Republican districter, uh, imagining myself to be a Democratic districter, to try and figure out what they were going to do. Uh, and my overall cycle is conclusion is that redistricting helps you at the margins. It helps a party. It does not help you win everything. If you look at the 1990s cycle, the 2000 cycle, the 2010 cycle, uh, what you see is that neither party was able to win all five 
congressional House of Representative elections win a majority uh, throughout five of those cycles. The Republicans lost in 92, uh, in 2006 and 2008, in 2018, and they look like they're going to lose in 2020. Um, the Republicans, uh, so in, it, 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 this cycle, I think we're going to see the advantage swing away from the Republicans. Uh, but I think also it will not be overwhelmingly uh, advantageous to the Democrats. We've now got some, some states have imposed by referendum or legislatures, um, supposedly nonpartisan redistricting commissions. Uh, my observation is that these always get successfully gamed by Democrats. They say, well, we're going to have this neutral political scientist uh, take part in this. Political scientists across the country, about 98% Democrats. Your neutral political scientist is going to tend to uh, favor a redistricting plan that looks a lot like what Democrats uh, are going to want most of the time. Um, and you've got limits by referendum imposed, for example, in Florida, a large state, which is set to gain a couple congressional seats, uh, which the Republicans have had the president, uh, have had the governorship in both houses of Congress. You've also got fewer states where either party could has going into it, fewer states with large numbers of House districts, that where one party has the governorship and the two houses of the legislature or in North Carolina, the governor does not have the legislative uh, veto on the redistricting bill. But in any case, um, I think that, uh, that looking ahead, that means that the districting for state legislatures and for congressional districts will be less favorable to Republicans in the past. But I think that that is modulated by the fact that uh, the Democrats have a disadvantage in any equal population uh, districting plan because they have tend to have their voters concentrated in a relatively few places. In central cities, some sympathetic suburbs, university towns, you find lots of places, you find areas as large as congressional districts voting 80 to 90 percent Democratic. You don't find 80, 90 percent Republican congressional districts anywhere. Republican voters are spread more evenly around the rest of the country and around the rest of large states that elect large congressional delegations. So there's a, it's a little harder for Democrats to eke partisan advantage uh, out of redistricting than it is for Republicans. Um, and so uh, let me just make one final point on redistricting. Um, I can recall from the 1950s that uh, Republicans had a theory it was put forward in the Michigan Constitution, adopted by the voters in 1963, supported by Governor George Romney, that people in lightly pop rural popularities ought to be overrepresented, ought to get more representation than they'd be entitled to on population. In the 2020s, maybe we'll see some liberals and Democrats roll out theories that people in the densely populated areas ought to be overrepresented. You know, they got more problems with government, they're more disadvantaged, they're more likely to be subject to racial discrimination or whatever. Uh, Supreme Court in the 1960s rejected the arguments for overrepresenting lightly populated areas. Uh, I expect the Supreme Court in the next decade to reject the arguments for overrepresentation of densely populated areas um, and perhaps to discourage people from making such arguments uh, as people at all. But if the last three Supreme Court justices had been appointed by President, not by President Donald Trump, but by President Hillary Clinton, maybe that argument would get some traction. Um, elections have consequences. Uh, so I uh, will just leave this bit of speculation about possible legal issues uh, for whatever Federalist Society members might like to take from it. Um, and perhaps, depending if the uh, election turns out, as most people expect, with some consolation for the likely results of the election next Tuesday, if you find those disappointing. So let me conclude at that point, and I will go to questions and answers. It sounds terrific. Uh, Michael, thank you. Uh, tour de force as usual. Um, uh, the chat room is open, so if you do have questions, 
uh, please uh, go ahead and get them in the queue. Uh, I will start with those, but uh, I, let me just get a summary uh, answer from you just in terms of the odds. What do you think the odds are that we're going to know the winner by 11 o'clock um, on Tuesday night. This is very important to those of us who uh, need our sleep. Well, to need your sleep, if you need, if for those of you who need your sleep, my advice is uh, take a long nap during take a nap. November 3rd. Um, I, look, it, if Florida tends to be tabulated pretty early. And one of the things that alerted many of us to what was happening in 2016 was the report from a that was relayed and got relayed over the internet widely circulated from a democratic consultant in tallahassee florida who said hey we got problems here we're carrying the large we the democrats carrying the large counties in florida by about what we need to carry them district wide you extrapolate from the results in 2004, 2008, 2012, and all of which Florida was a very close election. And of course, 2000, the official count was 537. I think the Democrats stole another 500 votes, but that's kind of a moot point now, 20 years later. Um, the, uh, but the fact is, he said, look, but the smaller counties, the places where he didn't say this, but I will say it, where you had a higher number of percentage of non-college graduate white voters were getting clocked by worse margins than we've ever seen before. And that was the difference that enabled uh, Donald Trump to carry Florida by 1% and was uh, a symbol that to many of us also who know where that much of Florida, many of those smaller counties are filled with the people who come from different parts of the Northeast, the Midwest, the South, um, that uh, there was gonna be problems for the Democrats as well in places like outstate Michigan, uh, Northern Wisconsin, uh, Iowa generally, non-metropolitan Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, because that's where these same people from Florida were coming from. So I'd say this, if it's a determined, if Donald Trump is losing Florida, I don't think we'll have to wait long for a result. I think it's gonna be hard for him to win with the dropping the 29 electoral votes uh, from the, what is now the third largest state in the nation uh, and so forth. It'd be possible, but it, uh, it really gets to be unlikely. Uh, and also because uh, those Florida voters have something in common with other people. If Florida looks like it's going to Donald Trump, then I think uh, you've got a race that may go on for some time. Uh, because of the greater propensity of Democratic voters to vote by mail, the results of which may not come in immediately on election night, and of Republican voters to vote in person on election day, because they are less risk averse about being in public places. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. We've got a couple of you're questions. Republicans, you're going to have Trump leads in many states that may or may not be eroded. As That's a so-called uh, red haze uh, phenomena that uh, Trump will look like he's leading on election day, um, and uh, that's a haze, and it will eventually blow off as a blue wave emerges. Do you, you put much credibility in that uh, that that theory. Well, I think something like that could happen if uh, in in many of these states because it will take some time to count those votes, and I can imagine that some of these counts are going to be pretty seriously contested. I mean, we had uh, cadre, cadre lawyers going to the sixty-seven counties of Florida in two thousand. Uh, we may see lawyers flooding into a lot of places. I, I look back to the. Uh, Washington state elections in 2004, I think it was, uh, Dino Rossi versus Christine Gregoire. It seemed like the Democrats had a, uh, you know, a back closet in King County in Seattle where they had a whole bunch of extra votes they kept finding till they got enough to win the election. I've always been suspicious about that result, although uh, such, you know, his, Mr. Gregoire was declared the winner and served the four years of the term. But um, I think you, you may find some real controversy about that.
Yeah, I can't hear you, Reg. While Reg is, uh, this is Dean Reuter, um, while Reg is working out his technical difficulties, Michael, um, yeah. let, me, let me go to the queue. Um, a question from Ken Masugi, the, the Trafalgar Group's polling was accurate, he says, uniquely so in 2016. Um, if that's the case, why not emphasize their polling this year? Uh, do you find their innovations in measuring polling regarding shy Trump voters as problematic? And uh, th this is echoed in a question from another uh, uh, audience member about um, not people being dishonest, but being reluctant to identify themselves as Trump voters in polls. Well, I'm, you know, I, I worked for Peter Hart, the Democratic pollster, 1974 to 81, and uh, my training there. Uh, regardless of party affiliation, was to be somewhat suspicious of new techniques. Uh, um, Robert Cahaley, the pollster for Trafalgar Group, uh, says that he has a series of measurements, including asking people what their neighbors are going to vote for, that enables him to identify shy Trump voters or people that are uh, actually for Trump but don't want to tell pollsters that they're for Trump. Um, other pollsters will tell you that there are no significant numbers of those people. Um, I note that uh, Trafalgar got uh, figures for uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania in 2016 that turned out to be pretty close to the final results. Um, I would want to know more about those polls before I'd state publicly that I either uh, think that the techniques he uses are justifiable or that they are not. Um, I look at them with interest. Um, I do not want to emphasize them over all other polls that are taking place. And I note that, you know, polling techniques that work in one cycle and tend to I, come close to final results don't necessarily do the same thing in the next cycle. Um, that's been the history of, of polling throughout. So I'll be cautious on that. On the other hand, you know, there's been some recent polling uh, about um, you know, particularly since the emergence of the Black Lives Matter group and people, you know, and the, the people like this fraudster Ibram X. Kendi claiming that everybody is a racist. Uh, it, you know, if you say you're not a racist, you're a racist. And if you say you're a racist, you're a racist. And so all white people are racist. Uh, people, you, you know, they've got numbers that show 56% of some subgroups say that people are less willing to say in life generally that they hold certain kinds of beliefs uh, and that that's much more true of people that identify as conservatives than people than of people that identify as liberals. Uh, so maybe, you know, maybe that's a fact that, you know, maybe uh, there's even more shy Trump voters, as it were, than uh, they, they think so in the past. Um, the shy thing, by the way, comes from shy because Tory voters in England, uh, particularly in the 1992 election when the Conservative Party won uh, after almost everybody expected the Labor Party to win. Um, but, you know, in the next election in 1997, the Labor Party won by a huge margin. So um, the shy Tories may or may not have still been shy, but there, there weren't enough of them. So I'm uh, undecided about that. I'm watching with interest. Do we have Reg Brown back? Reg, are you back with us? He might be trying to reconnect. Reg, are you uh, are you with us? We still can't hear Reg Brown. So, uh, another question. This one from um, Mario Loyola, Michael. Um, he has the impression that Trump's base of support is much more committed now, even than it was in 2016. Uh, how do the polls account for intensity of feeling and the impact of turnout? Uh, and how is that turnout? race looking just now? Well, vote, you know, we're, uh, we, we try to test intensity of turnout and you've got a number of signs that uh, Republican turnout may be great. Um, 
you have party registrations. Uh, Republicans have been narrowing Democratic advantages in party registrations in states like Pennsylvania and Florida uh, by significant amounts. Uh, partly that reflects a willingness of Republican party workers and party leaders to go out in the field and actually see people and the risk averseness of Democrats who feel that the risk from disease is too great to do that. That's an advantage that may be conferred. Uh, I think you have that feeling, uh, you know, the, the kind of people that Mario and I talk to and listen among the conservative movements, you find a number of conservative uh, voices being uh, more pro-Trump than four years ago. I think of the, uh, the, the radio broadcaster and, 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 and blogger, uh, ben Shapiro, for example, has a very wide office. Ben, uh, audience, Ben has been making the point that uh, he wasn't, he was neutral four years ago. He was skeptical about Trump. He's a solid Trump supporter this time, although criticizes him on some points. The overall polling, however, suggests that Trump is not getting the extraordinarily large percentage of non-college white voters that he was getting last time. Look at those very good maps that the New York Times has put out, the interactive maps showing the percentage, you know, who carries which cities and townships. Look at Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Iowa, 2016. Hillary Clinton is carrying just the central cities and the university towns. All these other areas, which you can see in previous elections, there were many areas that voted rural areas, small towns, suburbs that voted Democratic, were all Donald Trump. Those were unusually high numbers. The political analyst Ron Brownstein, for example, said the increasing number of Hispanics and Blacks are going to make this country democratic forever because whites can't vote any more heavily for Republicans than they did for Mitt Romney or for John McCain or for George W. Bush. Well, they, whites, non-college whites did vote more heavily for Donald Trump than they voted for those three previous Republican nominees. But that doesn't mean they necessarily will this time. And there's polling evidence that suggests they, they aren't prepared to do so yet. Uh, will Donald Trump's uh, performance of the debate work positively for him? Yeah, maybe. So, um, you know, we'll see. Uh, but I, I see conflicting evidence here. Reg, are you back? Reg, I think I may be back. Uh, we can hear you. We can hear you, Reg. Excellent. Uh, great. I, I apologize for that. Um, if you didn't cover it already, can you speak to some of the effects that you think the mass mail-in ballot situation will have? Well, the mail-in ballot situation, one thing I think it's going to be problematic for Democrats because when you mail in a ballot, often, and it's different in different states, um, you know, you have two envelopes, basically. One of the, the outside envelope, you're supposed to sign your signature so that the ballot, the counting people can verify your signature against the signature that's on file so that they signify that this is your ballot. And then the inner, then they take that envelope off and slough it off in their county. And then there's a second one that preserves, the, has no symbol of who you are and preserves the secrecy of the ballot. Some people who are doing this for the first time, some percentage of them are not gonna get this quite right. Will those ballots be counted? Uh, you will get a certain number of people that may fill in the ballot wrong. Um, we've seen that there are some uh, situations where uh, mail ballots have not gone in with the, uh, the way that through the mail the way they should. Our, our postal service has a much better record of reliability and things than postal services in many countries but it's not quite perfect and it's perhaps somewhat less perfect than it has been historically. So there's some problematic things. That's one area where if I was a Democratic Party official, I would be kind of concerned that the risk averseness of Democratic uh, voters um, may cost them a few. Um, so Michael, you have an extraordinary reputation for being nonpartisan and for calling it 
uh, like you see it. Um, not everyone in the media is perceived uh, that <laughs> way. Um, and I wondered if you uh, could comment on the impact of uh, the rise of the partisan uh, media um, and whether you think that uh, that's something that's here to stay or uh, perhaps will change in our lifetime. And if you could also comment on the role of social media in uh, this campaign cycle. Well, I, I don't know, I, you know, I would not claim to be totally neutral in political things by any means, but I have been a supporter of Democratic candidates years ago and more supportive these days of Republican candidates. So perhaps that helps me understand a little better than I would otherwise the motivations of people who vote for one side or the other. And, you know, I try to put myself in the positions. In the Almanac book, I've always tried to um, write it as in, a, in a neutral way. I think I got better at that as time goes on. Um, and, uh, and feel that, you know, making a positive case for people who've been elected to elective office, whether I'd vote for them or not, is something that I felt a responsibility to do in that venue. Um, the, um, are we more partisan than we used to be? Yes, we are. Um, you go back to about 1950, the political scientist, leading political scientist then E.E. E. Schatzschneider and uh, some others said, you know what we need? we need to really have, we've got this muddled politics with conservative Democrats from the South, with the liberal Republicans from the Northeast. We need to have one clearly liberal party and one clearly conservative party. That's our dream. That's our prayer. Well, their prayers were answered about 40 years later. And in the 1990s uh, and the years following, um, we find that uh, there aren't, you know, there, there aren't many liberal Republicans anymore. There aren't many liberal Democrats. And in a book uh, that came out, uh, I think in 2018, uh, How Americans' Political Parties Change and How They Don't, it's a little book, I kind of explained uh, where the conservative Democrats went and why they became Republicans. Uh, and why, where the liberal Republicans went, why they became Democrats, and how our, our parties rationalized. But they also rationalized uh, in large part around cultural issues, around non-economic issues, on issues that relate to the moral basis on which you try live or try to live your personal life. It means people feel strongly about those things. And when you bring them into politics, you find people feel strongly. Uh, the abortion issue has been one example of that. Uh, it's not unique in American history. Uh, you know, what was the Civil War about? That was about moral issues and about how people live their lives and things. And they felt very personal about it, that people went to war over it, literally. So um, these things inspire strong feelings. Um, you know, we haven't had uh, a congressman come over and thrash a, a, a senator from the other party within an inch of his life, as President Brooks did to Charles Sumner in 1857 or 1858. Uh, but, um, you know, it, 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 we, we clearly have strong feelings. I think, I think that's going to continue. I mean, uh, you know, electoral politics is... Uh, a, you know, is, is some elections are a zero sum game. Electoral politics is competitive. It's, um, it's an adversary process. Um, you know, it's not like elections to be president of the second grade where you're expected to vote for your opponent and all be nice to each other and things. It's uh, serious things are at stake in terms of public policy and in terms of values and uh, issues that people feel very strongly about. So, I think that's, you know, uh, that's going to continue to be the case. We have seen in these last five years, accelerated by the uh, peculiarities, eccentricities, or uniqueness of Donald Trump, but not solely because of him, um, some changes in party positions, some changes in what issues are emphasized because the world has changed in some ways. Um, and... Uh, you know, I, 
I don't feel this is the end of democracy. I don't feel that we are in Weimar, an equivalent of Weimar Germany, or that we're dealing with an Adolf Hitler, or that it's appropriate for one side of our political argument to call themselves the resistance as if they're uh, resisting the German occupation of France from 1940 to 44. But, um, you know, some other people disagree. So, Michael, uh, given the common notion that Trump has a narrower base of support than maybe your standard Republican candidate or is unattractive to many voters who would otherwise be inclined to support Republican candidates, why do you think he's running one to three points ahead of the Republican Senate candidates in battleground states like Iowa, North Carolina, and Arizona, uh, if, if that is in fact the case? Well, I think I'm a little puzzled why he's running ahead of Republican Senate candidates, because uh, four years ago, in fact, uh, Republican Senate candidates ran a little ahead of Donald Trump at Toomey in Pennsylvania, Ron Johnson in Wisconsin, um, and, and so forth, Rob Portman, certainly in, 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 in Ohio. Um, and, uh, you know, it, so I think that was different at that time. Um, one hypothesis is that it is difficult for a republic it has been difficult for a republican senator in these past 4 years to establish a personal profile an identification with particular issues some of which may you know appeal to voters beyond uh, the republican half of the electorate um, to do that because donald trump is sucking up and his opponents are sucking up all the oxygen in the air and uh, that's a working hypothesis. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Uh, one of the things you know, I've noticed with Senate races is they can surprise. Remember the Republicans captured a majority of the Senate in 2014. Go back 11 days before that election and see how many people were predicting that that was gonna happen or see how, the, you know, how closely the polls were indicating. It looked like Mitch McConnell was in a very tight race in Kentucky six years ago in 2014. Thanks, Michael. I think we'll end on that note that uh, there could be a big surprise and uh, we will take a nap and uh, hopefully uh, uh, I'd be watching you. I, I don't know what network to plug, uh, for you, will you be on air? All right, great. Well, uh, thank you so much for giving us your time uh, today. It's really thoughtful uh, commentary, incisive as always. Uh, for those of you uh, in the society, um, I wanted to remind you that we are uh, uh, coming up on the first ever uh, virtual Federalist Society. Uh, uh, convention. Uh, it will be free of charge. Uh, registration is apparently now open um, on the FedSoc uh, website. Um, we've got very exciting speakers lined up uh, this year for the national convention. I think the media will be very disappointed because they'll be able to watch the whole thing. Um, uh, and if uh, they're not careful, they may learn something. Um, so uh, excited about that. Um, hope that you all will Go ahead and, uh, and register. And again, Michael, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you very much. We owe you a, uh, a good Chinese lunch, uh, which hopefully we'll be able to uh, make good on uh, in the coming year. Thanks, everybody, for your time.